And Colin, we're going to again focus today on what happened in week one, how we react to it, what you're trying to do on waivers, who you're going to cut, who you're going to pick up, and, and how to think about some of the things that happened. There's just so many cool ways to look at this. We have to mention Ben's work with stealing signals. It's been absolutely phenomenal. The feedback to his week one piece, just, you know, out of this world, anybody who reads Ben will not be surprised by that. We have the stealing signals tool up, which is inspired by a lot of the stats that he uses in his pieces. We have the advanced stat tool. You can go in there and see the usage in a way that I think will mostly be comforting because what you discover when you're looking at the player usage from week one is that the guys you drafted to be used in a certain way were still more or less used that way. They just had one of these fluky games where they weren't targeted at quite the rate you would expect from someone who is a starter in a high-powered offense who's getting a lot of routes, or they were targeted and the targets just didn't manifest in the types of yardage, catches, touchdowns that you will normally get from your stars. And I have to say that as the week has progressed, I haven't gotten to a situation where I don't still wish I had drafted someone else other than C.D. Lamb on the handful of Lamb teams that I have. But I do think that he's going to be fine from the perspective of he's going to score fantasy points for you. Your team is going to be all right with him. Now you're going to get hit on some of the other players on those teams. And I think that can be the frustrating thing when you use a first, second turn pick on a player your thesis there is that that guy could be one of the ones who helps carry you to your fantasy title. I think that that's far less likely. <laughs> you know, we've kind of discussed that. But we're building teams here to where your first round pick could get hurt and you don't even get anything from them. Your second round pick, your third round pick, these guys could get hurt. You still go on to win your fantasy title. If CD Lamb in and of himself destroys your team, then... You know, in terms of our teams, it wasn't built properly. In terms of listener teams, it wasn't built properly. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a bummer because it is. But I think that he's going to do a little bit better than my initial reaction was. And I think those teams should still be fine. We just have to make sure that as we continue to let them evolve, as we look at our start sit decisions, as we look at our waiver decisions, that we continue to be that kind of weird combination of patient and aggressive where you can't panic you have to continue to push to try and put the best fantasy team out there yeah and you mentioned lamb specifically we will touch on him a little bit later in the show but we have talked about him here and you've obviously talked about him with ben on stealing bananas this week and your reaction was it was quite strong in terms of how to move him down but it wasn't just that he didn't play well then they had the offense didn't play well then you had Dak prescott got hurt there was a lot of stuff going into that and what you're saying there is a case of like last year, for example, if you Christian McCaffrey missed a huge chunk of the season, Derrick Henry was phenomenal, but then missed a huge part at the end. You do fall into those situations where sometimes first round picks just do not perform. And I don't think it's going to be a case or are not even on the field, I guess I should say. But I think Lamb is kind of somebody maybe at this point you need to think of like as a, a third round pick that is going to just, you know, keep that team ticking over rather than the player who is going to rocket ship that team into to first place but i think there's still going to be weeks where where he will be valuable but we'll be talking about him a little bit later sean you mentioned the stealing signals tool we touched on the some of the articles are up on the site obviously your work blair's work you mentioned the young guys that are getting involved now and it's just it's just been brought to a different level each and every season and each and every week so it's it's absolutely fantastic but i'm going to put in a, a plug here for anyone who hasn't signed up yet and doesn't have a road of his nfl pass to be able to access the tools access the content you can use the promo code RV Radio 2022 at checkout. That saves you 10% off a road of his NFL pass for a one-year subscription. If you're playing and you legitimately want to win your league this year and you're not reading Sean's work in depth and you're not looking at Blair's work, you're not using the tools, you know, I don't know what to tell you. So uh, once again, that code is RV Radio 2022 to sign up today. We were with our competition a few weeks ago, Sean. Some people who haven't had the chance to sign up before, you gifted graciously some one-month subscriptions. Those people are over the moon about getting access to the website. So hopefully uh, that will be a fun time for them as well. But Sean, the question that has come in to me, whether it has been on the YouTube comments this week, whether it has been in DMs, 
I get a lot of comments and we get this in our, our feedback as well for the reviews is, you know, it's the best kept secret or we don't want to tell our league mates about the, the podcast or the website. We get that a lot. So I do get a lot of DMs from people saying, I don't want other people to see me tweeting this to you, but we want to get the, the advice then on Sean's side. So the question that's coming in though is like, waiver wires, do I cut this player? Do I trade away this player? How do I make this move? Should I do this? Would you do this? And I felt that while we're saying to make sure you do react to week one, I felt that some of them were vast overreactions in certain ways. So it's going to be a more of how do people decide now in week two who to start? So we can use CD Lamb as an example if we want. We'll go through at the end some players to start, set, cut, or hold. But the likes of a Devontae Smith, a Brant Nayuk, a Darnell Mooney, all players, TJ Moore, for example, or Kyle Pitts even, who are all going relatively early in drafts in those first four or five rounds. And things may not have worked out exactly like people were hoping in week one. Maybe then they've gone ahead and they've gone to the waiver wire and they've picked up, uh, you know, I've seen in some of the, the waiver wire reports for the FFPC this week, quite a bit of money spent on players like Zay Jones, Dontrell Hilliard, um, you know, a lot of different names. Curtis Samuel was another one that was quite a bit spent on. So Taysom Hill, maybe a tight end, money being spent there as well. So those are players who had week one performances, but then you look maybe at the data and some of that data will show this is maybe something that they can continue to do, but other parts will be, maybe that's a one week out of the season that that's going to happen and it's not going to be something that we can rely on continuously. And then you have somebody like a Brandon Ayuk or a Darnell Mooney who didn't put up points versus somebody who has put up points in week one and trying to work through that decision as to, should you start them over those guys or should you set them? So I guess the the main topic that I have gotten, maybe they got this from listening to the recap show on Sunday, Sean. Maybe they got it from me. The worry might have came from from me putting it on them. But you know, we could there's certain players. Are we wrong? Could we still be right? What is the mindset there? So there's a lot of games left to play. So what do you think? in those scenarios is kind of the the psychological effects i guess of, of deciding who you should start that's probably where we we start here for the listeners and that leads into one of the issues that i think you do have if you get off to a bad week one or you have guys that you were hoping would emerge and they didn't because the bad week one can have some carryover effects that are really pretty negative right because if you played someone and they did poorly in week one, especially if that was stacked in with a couple other guys who maybe didn't hit their ceilings, then maybe you're off to an 0-1 start. And especially if you're in leagues where total points actually don't matter, and a lot of the leagues that we do sort of live drafts for, do drafts that we put together for shows, those are leagues where you have multiple paths and you're looking to be in the top four, but it's a top four based on best record, most points, best record, most points. And so losing in and of itself is not a disaster. Not scoring very many points isn't great, but our teams especially, and, and Rotoviz OT listeners teams especially, are going to be built to improve as opposed to with a week one focus. Now, that improvement isn't guaranteed, and not every team wins, obviously, but when you're drafting the correct profile of player and the right mix of positions, then your team is going to improve. You're going to be very good during the bye weeks. You do still have to, to work at it. You still have to make the proper waiver wire pickups. And one of the things that Ben and I discussed a little bit on Ceiling Banana is that there's a pretty big difference this week between 16 roster spot formats, where there probably still are plenty of, of good players to pick up and 20 roster spot formats where there's basically no one, right? I, I can't imagine or I can't remember a week one, especially in the FFPC, in these types of formats where there were so few players that really were relevant at all. It was one of the fun parts about playing in uh, this guillotine league for charity that you, Ben, and I are doing together as a road of his overtime bananas team where because the Eckler manager lost, we actually had something to bid on. We bid a lot there. We're pretty excited about that team because it now it has Saquon Barkley, Jamar Chase, Austin Eckler, and then you know, the, the usual suspects elsewise. So that part was fun because we actually got to make a big bid. All the FFPC teams had go through, go through, go through. And then in the end, it was just like, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing to bid on here. 
But the problem when you don't score points in week one and the players don't perform well is that now they become very difficult start sit decisions in week two. And for somewhat borderline players, you can get caught where now you go out and actually start a much weaker player due to the psychology of what happened in week one. That guy doesn't do it again because the much weaker players do have a much more narrow path to scoring points. It doesn't mean they couldn't actually have two good weeks in a row, but they have a much narrower path. And then the main people you drafted on your bench score a lot of points and you lose again. So you kind of want to avoid that. At the same time, one of the problems for not having a player play well in week one, if you drafted a lot of young guys, and and this is something that we do kind of run into from time to time, and we don't want to ignore or act like it's not, something that comes into play. I mean, there are so many advantages to drafting players with a lot of uncertainty, players with a wide range of outcomes. Blair wrote an article in the final week before the season started that was one of the best discussions of this that I think you know, you'll know you see anywhere. Those types of teams are the types of teams that we tend to win with. But it does introduce a potential problem going from week one to week two, if you have someone like a Sky Moore, if you have someone like a Devontae Smith, who you probably drafted in a range where on some teams you started him, and on some teams you may need to start him in week two, well, now you would kind of prefer not to start him, and you probably preferred not to start him in week one either, see how that game would play out with Jalen Hurts in the new offense. But that part of it where if you drafted someone who was bad in week one and now they're not a great week two start, you can easily get off to 0-2, and then you know, you start to feel the pressure. You start to be in a situation where a Sunday morning maybe isn't as fun. The thing that you have to do is just make the best decision you can with the information that you have and not try and worry too much about what happened in the previous week. Start your best players. If you are in a situation where you legitimately have to take the risk on Smith in week two, you do that. Don't start players who are just way down the line. If you have to start Smith you do that and you are encouraged by the fact that the Eagles offense was so potent. Obviously you're going to start Kyle Pitts. There are no tight ends out there who can be competitive. I still really like him as a difference maker for your individual fantasy teams. The biggest problem with Pitts is if he ended up on a team where two or three other guys didn't score, because again, once you go to 0-1, you don't score many points. You know, you don't want to be playing catch up for the entire season, but if you drafted the right type of team, in most cases, you're going to be able to go on a run. Colm, I'm not sure if I mentioned it on Sunday night, but I did have a team a long time ago now, but a team that scored 49 points in week one, one year. And I mean, 49 points is, is an incredibly low number. This is full PPR. It's not standard in like shallow starting lineups to where, I mean, 49 points is still not great, but you can do it. No, I mean, this is one of these leagues where you need to score like 150 and it scored 49. And you look at that team and you're like, I mean, to score 49, it's almost not even a situation where the team is bad. You're like, well, I just hit on every possible low score you could get. Yeah. And then that team goes on. It, it wins this league. It was more or less undefeated. It was almost the fantasy version of some of these Patriots and <laughs> Packers teams that we've <laughs> referred to where they got hammered in week one and then go on the stretch. But, but again, I mean, those things are issues, and that's one of the reasons why after the Thursday night game, I encourage drafters on Friday and Saturday in these formats you know, where you still are drafting to not take the guys who, number one, didn't score, and number two, are now in a more uncertain situation because not only could you not use them in week one, and there's a difference between drafting someone and having him not do well and drafting someone when you already know he didn't do well. Because then you definitely can't use him, but you also then can't necessarily use that player in week two. If you're using a top 10 round pick on someone where you actually have to watch them play in week two before you can start them in week three, that's an issue for you. Well, uh, that's now an issue for some of these teams as well who don't have that first Thursday night game to get some insight and make those decisions about. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mentioned some of the waiver wire additions and how things went and looking through some of the FFPC side of things, players that people may have picked up this week, the likes of Kyle Phillips, who was a, a big ad this week, Devin Duvernay, for example, Sterling Shepard was a, somebody who had some points at the end of last week. Uh, Donovan, Pe- Donovan Peoples-Jones had 
you know, a couple of a decent plays, Zay Jones, Curtis Samuel. They're all kind of players that I had mentioned a little bit about, DeAndre Carter, for example. But it is a case then that people may be making that decision this week between, you know, Devontae Smith and and those guys. And that's that's the next step that we have to to get to. The other part, Sean, was you know, when we look at players that I talked about, you know, people asking about should I cut this guy on the waivers to get somebody else. And some of those I felt like were massively like there should be no chance that you're doing this. There is certain players then that still should get cut. There's some players who we were adding to the end of our rosters that we were like, we want to see what happens in week one. One of those in season long managed leagues would be Trey McBride, for example. We talked about what if Zach Ertz doesn't play? What if uh, we have a situation then when Trey McBride gets the work? Well, it turned out Trey McBride was inactive for that. Zach Ertz played and while that was in garbage time to catch a touchdown so Trey McBride is somebody who's been cut quite a bit this week but Daniel Bellinger and these are names again to keep an eye on keep in the back of your, your notepad for if anything does happen and you need to pick these players up but somebody I was very surprised Sean to see cut at the rate he was this week over the FFPC was KJ Hamler and it's not nice actually for me to look at this list because quite a few of them are, are players I heavily drafted Ronald they're, they're Jones cutting your, you're cutting your guys Colin uh, yeah, well, I didn't cut them, but everyone else is cutting them. We have, uh, you know, Amir Abdullah was one of the big cuts this week. David Bell was a big cut. Sammy Watkins, who we weren't on, was a big cut. Ronald Jones, um, Kenny Galladay, but KJ Hamler. There's players, I think, like this week, somebody like KJ Hamler catches, like you and Ben talked very well about this, is, you know, Ben wanted to see more from the Broncos before making that overall decision. A very good point that was made is, you know, Pete Carroll knows all the tendencies that Russell Wilson has. They can plan against that, and they have all offseason to do it. We see this sometimes after bye weeks where teams you know, can can really manipulate game situations. So I think that you know this week we could have KJ Hamler catching that touchdown that Jerry Judy catches. Next week he's the, the biggest ad on the waivers again. So I think there is that patience element. But sometimes you don't have those players at the back end of your roster that you can move around. So the next part, Sean, of the conversation comes into – those players that I mentioned and you mentioned like not going too far down but if it is a, a DJ Moore versus let's say a, a Donovan Peoples Jones this week I do think some people will be battling with that decision as to, to who to go with my interpretation at this point of the season is always to roll out those guys that you took in those first four or five rounds unless it's a situation where you think that like they're just not going to get any targets are you still and the situation where like DJ Moore, Darnell Mooney, Brant Nayuku I mentioned, I actually thought Devontae Smith looked good last week, but just the situations didn't play out to, to what we kind of wanted exactly. A lot of it was obviously going to AJ Brown, but I think AJ Brown now this week getting a little bit more attention, I think is going to help Devontae Smith, for example. Are you, you know, if we were advising the listeners, my advice would be to, to try and keep that patience, go with the guys that, that you drafted in those early rounds or would you have certain situations where you would make a, a cutoff to say let's let's go with some of these guys that were on the waivers yeah i mean you've got to stick with your stars even cd and, land oh yeah i mean i want to joke and i want to that got- sean was so low sean was going to start amari cooper over cd lamb this week i thought that's how low he was Come on, we have no amari cooper and <laughs> Was Amari Cooper a big cut this week? Surprisingly, was not in that top end of the list. So uh, you draft I, I someone th- in round seven; it's a hard cut after one week. Yeah, it's a bad decision, though. Well, I mean, we can't. You always want to not criticize other people's bad decisions because you gotta gotta wrestle with your own. The yeah, the most straightforward thing here, I would just simply say, is if you're picking guys up off the waiver wire who are not competitive against good teams, then you've already lost. I mean, you can't put yourself in a situation where now your new team and your new starting lineup has more or less just capitulated. I mean, some of the players that you're talking about and some of those start set decisions, if you go with that, your, you know, median outcome scoring wise is just so much lower than your opponent. You are now looking for extreme outcomes to give yourself any chance to win. It is frustrating if you have someone like Liam, if you have someone like DJ Moore. And I think that the DJ Moore game actually is a concern. Yeah. Well, that was one of the ones where Ben and I maybe disagreed a little bit. He had a lot of good notes on Michael Pittman. And I mean, one of the things is that the results are going to end up mattering. The situation with CeeDee Lamb and the situation with Michael Pittman, very similar. And yet because Pittman was able to come through 
and make some of those catches, score that touchdown, even though the overall offensive dynamic has a lot of similarities. You have a bad offense, you have a bad quarterback. You're going to be forced targets because you have no quality receiving teammates. You know, how does that work throughout the course of the season when the defense can just key on you and key on you and key on you? And every week you're facing a new almost gimmick defense to take you away because your opponent knows that they don't have to worry about anything else. Now, with the Colts, you have to worry about Jonathan Taylor. With the Cowboys, you don't have too much to worry about in the running game either. But when we're trying to stay kind of on balance with these players, we want to look at guys like, first of all, anybody who played in that San Francisco-Chicago game, I don't think you can be worried about at all. No, the issue with Brandon Ayuk is more, is he really startable in the first place as opposed to, are you worried about week one? He looked fine. Trey Lance actually looked pretty good when you adjust for the context. So I wouldn't be worried about those guys. Can Darnell Mooney get open when they don't have other players? The fact that they got big touchdowns from players who should not be in the NFL, I mean, maybe that helps defenses play it a little bit more honest. And it can't just be, you know, let's double and triple team Darnell Mooney. <laughs> let's make sure we take out Cole Komet because Justin Fields showed that he can beat you. And I mean, are the Bear is going to beat people each week. It was interesting just here looking on ESPN. Their current win predictor has this as an 88 to 12 game for your Green Bay Packers on Sunday night football. 88 percent, I assume, rather than 88 points to 12 points, because that would be a very high scoring game. Well, if it were 88 points, then so this is kind of a fun one, too, where we talk about overreact, underreact. What do we do? Column. You and I drafted a team where we didn't hit any of the elite quarterbacks and we had a, a late draft position. So because of that, we wanted to push quarterback and nobody fell to us that, that really seemed like a difference maker in a range that was flat. We were trying to get as much value as we could at the other positions to make up for what our draft position was. We ended up taking Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Justin Fields. More or less all three of those guys miss in week one, although I would argue that Justin Fields, even though it's not a good fantasy score, extremely encouraging. He's the guy I'm probably most excited about from that group. The Buccaneers, even though it did not work to Tom Brady's favor, they ended up kicking a bunch of field goals in that game. That offense looked fine. Now, they do already have a bunch of their receivers injured, so that may slow down the points on slot at least over the next month. But I mean, your own psychology matters on some of these players too. So, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is someone that I'm predisposed to be frustrated with if he does things that I don't like. Whereas on a lot of players, you're kind of predisposed to be like, well, I mean, that's the way it works sometimes. You don't always have good games. With Brady, Fields, and Rodgers all on that team, I was very ready to go ahead and just cut Aaron Rodgers. After you are. One. You, you are. Uh, Let the listeners know you had a you had him uh, ready to be wavered. I had to. I had to veto it. <laughs> so, so Colin vetoed that. We still do have the three quarterback options. We're going to be able to see those guys play another week. A lot of what happened in week one, you do have players who are. I mean, these guys are amazing athletes. They're amazing football players, but they're not above average NFL players. And if you start to load your roster especially at a position like wide receiver where you need to have stars and you need to be able to hammer people during the bye weeks. If you start to kind of backfill that roster with guys who are not average NFL players because they've hit a narrow outcome in week one, then your team just isn't going to be good. It's, it's not a solution for it. So I would encourage people to not be too quick to pull the trigger on some of those moves. You've got to stick with, your guys and and see what they're going to do over this first month at the same time if you do get a result that i think is, is a reasonable result that changes how a player looks then i think you want to go for it so the player i was interested in after week one was curtis samuel and he's somebody i put some pretty decent sized bids in for we talked a little bit on this show quite a bit on ceiling bananas i've written a ton on the site about these really cool RV Triflex dynasty leagues. And one of the awesome parts, but also one of the frustrating parts there is that there are only 20 roster spots. And so you get all of these players you want to keep, but you end up having to cut them. 
in that kind of week, two weeks before the season, you're actually working pretty frantically to trade players in order to get down to the roster limit. Well, then week one happens and suddenly you want to make pickups now because there are some interesting players on waivers due to the fact that other people also had to cut guys. And now you're looking at it and trying to decide, well, do I want to cut these guys that I just worked feverishly to get down to 20? Do I have players I can cut to pick people up? So Blair and I were actually discussing last night whether or not to pick up DJ Chark, who actually was cut by one of our opponents after the cut down when they picked up some guys on free agency. And then Curtis Samuel, who obviously not necessarily going to be rostered in every 20 person dynasty league there. We did pick up both of those guys. We cut Ty Chandler, a player we really like for the long term, but maybe one of the things when you're looking at how you're going to cut players in a shallower dynasty format is how much trade value do they have in the medium term? Because, I mean, Chandler is a great dynasty stash if you have 30 roster spots. He looked fantastic in training camp. He looked fantastic in the preseason. He's got this underrated prospect profile. He does look like he's going to be the long-term backup in Minnesota, perhaps the future starter if things you know, go in the wrong direction for Dalvin Cook. The, the running backs just aren't able to play you know, into their mid-30s, obviously. So he's a good fit in a lot of situations, but he's not going to bring some big value in trade over the next month. You have to play a 20 roster spot in Dynasty a little bit more like redraft. And so you can part with him. The other player that we were sort of mixed on was Mike Kosicki, a guy we actually could have traded for not anything fancy, but you could have gotten some value out of him even 10 days ago. Now, obviously, you can't. Because one of the things you did see in week one was that all of these signs and all of the rhetoric kind of surrounding Mike Kosicki and the fact that he wasn't a good fit for this offense. But you do hear that kind of thing from time to time. And then you have week one and it turns out, oh, someone who is huge and extremely athletic, that person is a good receiving weapon. They're still going to factor into the game. Well, he did not. Now, one of the things here too with the Dolphins is that they didn't have a, to run a huge number of passing plays in the second half because they had that easy lead on the Patriots and the Patriots actually moved the ball. All right. But it took them a long time to go up and down the field. So you don't have a huge number of plays. Obviously you're trying to get Tyreek Hill involved. Even Jalen Waddell had a very good game, but didn't have a ton of volume. Mike Kosicki could easily bounce back. He's not necessarily somebody that we wanted to cut. I think he's still a very good NFL player. He'll be valuable in the future, but we did go ahead and drop those two guys to pick up Chark and Samuel because if Samuel has another good game here, then suddenly he is going to have trade value in the short term. And, and you want to be thinking about some of these things from the perspective of trade value. The other element with Curtis Samuel is he's a guy who was an early draft pick. He's extremely athletic. Not last year, but the year before, he had 1,000 yards from scrimmage. So when you're picking up a player who still is kind of mid-career, Curtis Samuel came into the NFL young, even though he's gone through so many travails as an NFL player, you know, still in an age where if he's actually healthy, <laughs> then he's extremely athletic. He could do something there. I mean, Connor was drafting him quite a bit in underdog and had mentioned that to me on some of the teams we were drafting together. I kind of resisted that and mentioned, I mean, he hasn't stayed healthy. They do have this team now that has multiple interesting receivers. Jahan Dotson probably looks like a, a star. He definitely looked like a star in week one. They have poor quarterback play. So those things that I was mentioning in saying that he wasn't a target for me in best ball, those things could still end up being true. It could be that week one is the mirage and not the rest of it. But I think that for the reason that Connor was drafting him in the first place, when you do look at what his background is, then he, when he comes out with this original game and runs 35 routes, I mean, some of these situations, you, know, you look like Taysom Hill, for example, who had a big game, looked like somebody who could actually factor into what the Saints are going to do because they just I mean, they've got a lot of talent, but they have a quarterback who's not any good. And so that part makes it difficult for the offense to move the ball just in general. And he didn't play a ton outside of those big plays. Curtis Samuel, 35 routes. Dotson, McLaurin, 39 routes. So only four fewer routes. He's out there on 78% of the dropbacks. He gets 10 targets. They manufacture him some other touches. It's not that he's going to have a game like that every week 
and you should definitely not expect that. But I think that the combination of his background and then the way he was used in week one, even beyond the points, put him into the conversation where I think that's a very legitimate pickup. And if you have a guy where the usage was very low in week one that you're worried about and you want to watch again in week two, then you could start Curtis Samuel. That doesn't mean it's going to work, right? Because we would expect Dotson and McLaurin to still be sort of the engine for this offense you have Antonio Gibson looked very good as well. He could be one of the key members. At some point, Brian Robinson is going to come back and probably take some of these manufactured touches just because, I mean, they also want to get Robinson involved. So this sort of poor man's Debo Samuel role that we saw from Samuel in week one, that's probably going to evaporate. And yet, again, the combination of elements, I think, makes him someone who's interesting. And you have to take seriously... He makes sense on teams. Most of the other pickups from week one do not. That's interesting. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out. And we're going to do a little game here. And then when we get to the last one, the la- these guys are facing each other this week, Sean. And I have a thought that I'll share with you on the last two names. But this is basically going to be start, set, cut, or hold. I'm hoping that there's no cuts here. There's one guy that you wanted to cut this week, but we'll see what we do at the end. So we have C.D. Lamb, Kyle Pitts, D.J. Moore. I only want... One word. So we have CD Lamb. Are you? You have to be starting them. Start. Yeah. Start. And I think it's going to be the same here for for me. It's pretty much the same for all these guys. We have Kyle Pitts. We need to keep that confident, Sean. Do we have some listeners out there who have both Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and Kyle Pitts? Because in that situation, maybe you. Can... Some people like to go bully tight end, but yeah, that would be optimistic to have all three on your roster. I think you have to be. We we took him at 107 in the main event, Sean. I didn't mention this to you. There was some, you know, screenshots taken from different uh, apps to say like, oh, some people were drafting Kyle Pitts over Travis Kelsey, and I was very happy to say like, yeah, that that last team there, that's my team. Uh, they were like, oh, very nice of you to admit it. I was like, there's there's one week gone here. Let's see how the the rest of it plays out. So a massive weekend coming here for Kyle Pitts. That would really help uh, help things around these parts of the the road of his overtime. Colin, what what are, what's what are your thoughts after one week? Do you, you still have it 50 50? The Pitts outscores Kelsey? Do you have it 40 60? I would say I would still go 50 yeah. 50. I, I think like Kelsey is somebody who's going to have absolutely massive weeks, but we're also going to have massive weeks from Pitts. You know, if, if, if we say Pitts goes out and scores you know, 25 plus points this week in tight end premium, I don't think that's a stretch. I think he, you know, and we're going to have weeks for both of those guys get into the 30 point range so both players stand healthy all season kelsey probably does still still outscore him but there's a lot of different uh, things that'll play in i i think we I, i'm not too panicked about pitch yet if he if he comes away with uh, less than 10 points this week we'll have a different conversation on on sunday night's recap i don't think that we even will i mean i think we'll just pitch ignore is it. that good i mean <laughs> the people who are not on him are going to feel like they were right yeah. And I, I don't have any problem with that. If you had reasons that you didn't want pits and you feel like those reasons have played out through two weeks, then you should feel like you're right. Yeah, I, I think like, but I'm not can... going to be worried if he yeah. has another bad game, he's going to have a massive season unless I, I, the Atlanta Falcons are going to have to have that team massively implode and things just completely self-destruct for Kyle Pitts to not have the season that we're hoping for yeah no i would agree with that i think like the conversation is nobody had him outside of the top three tight ends so you take him one round earlier than other people were taking him i don't think that's like a stretch i do think the him versus kelsey part is is interesting but you you have to play out the the entire season we'll see what happens then but well part of the reason to take pitch in that range too is to get i mean he's not coming back and you want to get the tight end and you want to get that tight end with the possibility of Saquon Barkley or DeAndre Swift, which we were able to execute in a lot of leagues. And so it's that one-two punch, not just pits in a vacuum. Now, again, you can say, well, you should have had that one-two punch with Travis Kelsey. I like where we're set up. I like yeah, where this is I, I do too. And uh, yeah, I'll just hold back on those victory laps for, for a little bit yet. That was but more we're going to have to hold back on the victory laps since we're not currently winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly. You know, and... Please, other people respect our privacy as we we hold back on our victory laps here. Uh, DJ Moore, Sean, that was more than one word. DJ Moore, start, set, cut, or hold? 
it's going to be a little contextual because some people are going to have six awesome wide receivers. <laughs> if you have six awesome wide receivers, I can see you sitting DJ. Well, here, here's no, the big picture. Uh, we're going to say start. Yeah. You, you could have started a roster from the 112 with CD Lamb, Kyle Pitts, DJ Moore, uh, Darnell Mooney, uh, Devontae Smith, and Brant Nayuk. You could legitimately have done that. The problem would be then that the next three guys I have on my list here are Devontae Smith, Brant Nayuk, and Darnell Mooney. So you have to start some of these guys if that was your, your starting roster true. It seems like you still lost rounds. like one round of value in there somewhere if that's your team. Yeah, but, but no, it's because that's going to be. You a wanted to get them on your roster. You didn't want to like mess out on them. So you reached around okay. on every play. I gotcha. I gotcha. So uh, I, I'm still starting all three of those guys this week. What about you? Yeah, well, again, I mean, I'm I'm very – well, I guess I was harder to talk into DJ Moore this year because the week 17 last year column where he did not get into our starting lineup. It was heartbreaking. It was. And that – I mean – I'm not going to forget that one for a while. So it did take, <laughs> it did take a good situation or an approved situation with Baker Mayfield to make that tenable at all. I would not have been in with Sam Darnold or Matt Corral. I also think that after watching week one, you should not be in with Baker Mayfield. This team is extremely poorly coached. You just got to hope that DJ Moore is that good. You're going to have this game here with the New York Giants could be fairly low scoring it could be an overreaction from the panthers themselves where after really not using christian mccaffrey in week one where he has 30 touches we'll see how this one goes uh, dj Moore might be, is still I, I did this fantastic, list. and you need to have great players if you're going to have great teams i just hope that things can get a little bit better there yeah i, I did this list i'm probably the most worried about starting dj Moore. I, I, like he's probably the one that concerns me the most the last two though sean these guys face off against each other on sunday night football one of them you wanted to cut this week one of them you said you are the most excited about between tom brady Aaron Rodgers, and himself it is justin fields the other one is Aaron Rodgers. cut Aaron Rodgers, i think is probably your preferred option here yeah i mean if you've got other options <laughs> uh, and then just on the way think- back We'll see what happens with Lazard. The, one of the frustrating things, too, there is that they did not give Romeo Dobbs, the one guy out of that group who had had a fantastic training camp and looked good in the preseason. And then they come out in the real game. And they're like, oh, well, you know, we're not sure if he can do it. Perhaps he runs a little bit of the wrong route early on. He goes one direction. Aaron Rodgers throws it the other way. They jog off the field. You know, Romeo goes and gives him a little bit of that pat, what have you. Aaron Rodgers refuses to look at him. Romeo's like, well, this guy's just a jerk. <laughs> He's still the guy on that team who looked like he was capable of doing anything in that game, and they tried to make the other guys the focal point. If they come out in week two, and it's Alan Lazard, Romeo Dobbs, and then Christian Watson worked in, maybe he catches the long touchdown this week. Very easy to see the Green Bay Packers bounce back. It's just when you have multiple things where you have Rodgers and his behavior, but then you also have the coaching staff not putting Dobbs out on the field enough. You have multiple things to be very frustrated about as a fan. Yeah. The only quarterback in the entire NFL that Sean talks about his behavior or his off the field antics is Aaron Rodgers. Uh, but I thought that the we talked about the leadership style. The one thing that disappointed me a lot in this when the team was down, it looked to be Romeo Dobbs who was going around trying to you know get the offense of players wanting to, to get back into the game. But I think that we'll look back. The Vikings and particularly on the road, but the Vikings in general, that defense has been, and I know it's not Mike Zimmer this there now, it's given Rodgers troublesome games. And I think we could see this when we look back at the end of the season that the Vikings could be a lot tougher opponent than maybe people were expecting. Or it could just be a one-off, but you know, this is an offense where Patrick Peterson at the end of his career, but has kind of forgotten about But they signed Zedaria Smith from the Packers who had a lot of, you know, want to to kind of ruin this game for Green Bay. They have Harrison Smith, they have Daniel Hunter, they have Eric Kendricks. They have a really, really strong defensive unit. And I think that then in situations where you have those rookie players, that there is obviously not a good scenario to try and ad lib stuff that he could have done with say with Devontae Adams, for example. But I think that we'll look back. You mentioned the the op- or the kind of opportunity to win that is given on, on some sites this week. I'd be shocked if the Packers don't beat the Bears at home, but I just still think that the, the Bears will put up fantasy points. I think the Packers will lead from the start in this one, and I think it's going to be a, a different scenario. And if they don't do what I'm after saying, Sean, 
you can veto anything I say about Aaron Rodgers next week, and you can you can cut him off the roster. But no, I think you, we should. You can, I mean, you can stick out for Aaron Rodgers as long as you want. You, you need to, and it's really cool. Romeo. It's actually good for the show as well because people will enjoy the back and forth <laughs> to hear Sean giving out about Rodgers. But but I love what you mentioned about Romeo Dobbs. I think he's somebody you are wanting to get out there and desperately acquire in all formats. You kind of in terms of the start set cut hold, you kind of skipped over these guys with Devontae Smith, Brandon Ayuk, Darnell Mooney. Colin, I ask you, Devontae Smith, start set cut hold this week. I'm gonna start all these guys, him, Ayuk, and Mooney. That's what I mentioned. Sorry if I, I skipped over it, but I, I'm still oh, starting. So, them so out. you're just start, start, start. I I would like to to sit slash hold with Ayuk and Mooney if you have that opportunity. Smith is an I interesting think one. You, you... I think you go right back out with him. But the main thing with Smith and Ayuk is that this is a great opportunity. And, and a lot of the people who have them on their dynasty league are going to be thinking about it the same way. They're like, ah, that wasn't what I wanted to see, but I'm now I'm going to get all of these buy low offers that I have to decline. You still want to send those buy low offers out. Devontae Smith, Brandon Ayuk, fantastic players. If you can get them at a discount this week, you have to do it. Yep. No, you have to do it. I, I think, like, um, especially though with Ayuk and Mooney, that game for me is like if you, if you go back and watch it, if you haven't, don't watch the whole game, but just watch a couple of plays to see how wet that surface was, to see how the conditions were so bad. It was nearly impossible to play, you know, proper passing football in those situations. So that's why I'm I'm willing to to give a pass on those. And I, I think there'll be people this week who are going to set those guys. And not all three of them will have big weeks, but you know, if one of those guys goes out and has a, a hundred yards and a touchdown, I'm not going to be overly surprised. And that. The well, Colin, there was a little bit of a contrast between the two games that had some similarities where the Jets actually moved the ball and racked up a bunch of sort of garbage time points as the weather got better in that one. But one of the problems that the 49ers had and one of the reasons that Trey Lance didn't have really hardly any fantasy points in week one was the weather got worse yeah. as they were in garbage time. And so it just didn't create an environment where they could score at all in the fourth quarter. And you know, you, you lose those as real plays in a football game. The games just aren't that long, and a lot of the points are scored toward the end. It, it just was a context that was going to limit all of that. And I mean, even if you watched the first half, you'd be surprised at just how bad the second half was from a weather perspective. 